Hey YouTube, Mike the Alpha Hoarder here. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I've got a different sort of video today. I actually want to play one of Rudy's videos and talk through it a little bit. Um, I, I've never really done that before. I'm certainly not a React channel or anything like that. But he released a video recently called This Time Feels Different. And it echoed a lot of the sentiments that I myself had brought up uh, on this channel several weeks prior to that. And so I just wanted to sort of go through it together and share some thoughts about what he's saying and why I think it's significant. Uh, and while I do that, I'm just going to open, you know, a few boxes. But because that's going to be playing, I'm not going to say too much about the cards. Uh, where do we start? We have Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum and crypto type stuff hitting either all-time highs or above all-time highs by the time you watch this video. Um, we've had an increase in the amount of people paying and engaging in transactions using um, the crypto in the magic world. But I have to admit, I'm not seeing any form of major bullish uptick for older vintage ABU um, Four Horsemen era, Urza's era, 90s era, sealed boxes, single cards. As much as I would like to really be like, yeah, woo, everything going up. Um, we're really not seeing that still. Okay, so first of all, obviously a couple of weeks changes a lot in crypto. Easy come, easy go. I guess we'll see what happens next. But uh, why is that relevant? Why is the Bitcoin stuff relevant? Well, there's been a lot made of the correlations between crypto and collectibles. Um, those correlations are definitely real. Uh, I've Many of us have observed them in the past. Um, there's a couple of reasons here. The first one is just purely historical. So if you don't know, uh, Mt. Gox, M-T-G-O-X, M-T-G, online exchange, um, was originally the sort of OG TCG player. It was a peer-to-peer -peer, um, way to, to buy and sell your cards, your magic cards. And uh, it never got quite the traction I think it was going for. And then very early in Bitcoin's history, it sort of pivoted into being a crypto exchange. Um, and then of course it sort of infam infamously was uh, hacked and collapsed and all that stuff. But nonetheless, that origin gave Bitcoin a somewhat disproportional, um, a disproportional roots, I would say, in the magic community. Purely because of the overlap of people. Another reason is pretty simple, although most people won't admit it. If you make $10,000, say, because your Bitcoin holdings triple, uh, and you bring that on to most exchange platforms, particularly in the United States, and you sell it, that's going to trigger a tax event. That exchange is going to send, you know, a 1099 or whatever to the IRS, and you're going to pay capital gains on the 10K, uh, which could easily be, you know, double-digit percentages. Um, but if instead you buy something with that Bitcoin, realistically speaking, uh, dealers are not filing Form 8300. Uh, and yes, you're still supposed to report that as a tax event if you exchange um, capital like that for a good, but people don't. People don't even take PayPal goods and services to save the fees, so let alone self-reporting that kind of thing. Uh, and so what happens is people prefer to just convert their free internet money, um, money that could evaporate at a moment's notice, into something tangible and unregulated to boot uh, into a collectible asset. So there is a lot of that. Um, pro tip, don't do that. Uh, then on top of that, there's just a lot of people who want to convert Bitcoin into something a little less volatile. Um, you know, perhaps they're still willing to speculate, but they want to be speculating a little less. Collectibles are a good, you know, alternative for that. So, um, yeah, that's, that's why there's historically been something of a link between crypto and, and um, collectibles, specifically magic. It's not happening this time. Uh, and I think some of that is because there's just less going on with magic. You know, around the pandemic, we had the government stimulus money and it was creating sort of a pump on collectibles and crypto and it was just leading to feedback loops. Uh, 
So, you know, that's not there right now. There's also some uncertainty around the Bitcoin halving, which is coming up um, in a couple of weeks. So, you know, people might have different views on the right time to sell versus hold for that. So, um, anyway, back to what Rudy was saying. We're really not seeing that still, which is kind of surprising. I thought we would, if I had to predict, I thought when we'd really see this, um, I don't know if I want to call it wealth creation or wealth transfer. I, I, I thought for sure when we saw a huge uptick in especially Bitcoin, we would start to see some overflow or profit locking or kind of moving over, sweeping into vintage magic. But I mean, buy lists of old cards, I mean, they're off their lows from six months to a year ago. I mean, they're maybe up 10, 20 percent, maybe 30 percent from all time lows. I'm not tracking alpha rares like I used to. There's still too much inventory for me to do that realistically. Um, but I haven't seen 30 percent price increases anywhere I've been looking, you know, maybe 10 percent. But uh, anyway. But really, we've had very lackluster excitement in old magic even on this channel i haven't really covered a lot of old magic or you know buyouts or price spikes or all-time highs or if you've actually noticed most of the videos about upticks and things have been on new magic there is always that one that there is always that small chance that the glory days of all of these old magic cards and old fogies and nostalgia and all this you know, there's always this theory in the collectible world that certain genres, certain collectibles have a peak and newer generations will not connect with previous generations, maybe nostalgia connections. Because young people today do not have nostalgia. If you're, if you're 18 years old today, or 21 years old, in the United States, you're not saying, man, when I was a teenager, when I was... 13, 14, 15, 16, middle and high school. Man, everybody was playing with 4th edition Ice Age and revised dual lane. Like, that's not a real thing for the next generation. This is a striking comment. Rudy is a well-known permable. So, you know, I, I've had and I've heard many conversations like what he's saying, sort of privately. Uh, and, you know, like I said, I, I posted a video on the subject myself, you know, prior to this. But Rudy never really gives this topic very much airtime. And the fact that he's doing it now is interesting. Uh, you know, historically his line was stay, stay the course. He's recalled Chronicles and sort of the mid-2000s when Magic was quote-unquote dying. Uh, his recurring line is always how he finds it interesting that the more things change, the more they stay the same. That's one of his lines. Uh, which is sort of about how most people don't understand the larger cycles in the hobby. And um, they therefore get discouraged when things are down, not realizing that, uh, you know, it's normal. And the implication there being a downturn now is, is the same as uh, such downturns in the past. So given, given that general attitude of his... Uh, this this comment of his is very revealing. Um, you know, as to his point, he's right. Nostalgia isn't there for the new entrants into the market. The question is if these, you know, these people that are coming into the hobby will ultimately become collectors. As I've described before, there is a tendency among most collectibles for the collectors to seek the sort of trophies of the hobby even if, if they weren't around when those trophies were originally, you know, printed or made or in sports when those players were playing. Uh, but y you have to make collectors if you want people to seek these old cards for reasons other than nostalgia. But it seems to me that still requires those players to have nostalgia for their era of the game. In other words, they have to become drawn into the hobby and start collecting and then they will move towards these older cards but i worry that players don't really do that today given the sort of the velocity of sets and the particular formats that are popular 
Uh, but anyway. Historically, there is always that small chance that a, you know, I hate to use the term super cycle. People throw that term a lot around from Wall Street and crypto and stuff like that. I, I'm not really a big fan of that that super cycle kind of, it, it's almost like an emotional, like a, oh, hurry up, hurry up. It's kind of a, I don't know, maybe a FUD term. But it, there's always a small chance that, you know, the peak of the euphoria did happen from, you know, 2016 to 2020 into 2021 when it had the blow off. There is always a real chance that we don't really experience in the next decade or the next so many years or in our lifetime another reserveless buyout, crazy extreme type of demand for old magic cards. Now, that doesn't mean the card revised dual lands and cannot continue to drift higher and go up 5, 10, 15% a year. We're not saying it's not possible. But what I'm saying is the you don't feel it. So here he's getting at what I have been calling the generational handoff. Um, he says it's a low probability, this uh, super cycle as he calls it. Um, I think some of that is his inherent optimism, uh, you know, and, and his love for the cards. Um, I'm not sure what evidence he has particular, particularly that uh, it's a low probability. I mean, to be perfectly blunt, descending into oblivion is kind of the default uh, for, you know, most collectible hobbies. So I would say the burden of proof, so to speak, is uh, in, in showing why the hobby is likely to survive to the next generation, and not the other way around, only because the other way around is so much more common. Um, in any event, uh, he then mentions that it doesn't mean the card prices can't still drift up. Now, that observation might appear to contradict uh, what he just said, um, but it need not. So uh, suppose, suppose the worst comes to be and the hobby has peaked, which means new collectors are not entering the hobby. Um, so as collector demand vanishes, the market will come to reflect only player demands. Whereas right now it's very hybrid. You know, you have your collectors, you have your players, you have your speculators, you have your dealers, you have... Um, it's a very complicated market. If some of those participants leave and the concentration of players increases, that will change the dynamics of the market. Um, this would change tons of things in the vintage market. For example, it could destroy vintage sealed that is not draftable. Um, for example, single tournament decks, you know, loose tournament decks of revised or something. Uh, this would probably have a significant impact in the pricing spread between near mint cards and played cards, just because players have different priorities on those sorts of things. Uh, but on the flip side of all that, it would, it would allow certain playable staples, like say, you know, dual lands or, or something like that, um, to indeed keep rising against the rest of the vintage market. So that, that is possible. It is possible for both of those things to happen and uh, to, to be true. It doesn't feel like the vintage cards have any traction still. And the funny part about that is, a lot of vintage cards are actually, they have gone up from the lows a year ago. Almost all old magic is up between 10 to maybe even 30, maybe even 35, 40% for a couple select outliers. But the average vintage card is up 10 to 30% from its lows a year or so ago for Magic 30. Okay? Two-year bear market, Magic 30, overprinting, all these things that happen that just annihilated dumpster, the biggest dumpster fire we've ever seen in modern history of Magic. And even though some of these prices have gone up, nobody seems to care. I think we're basically seeing a correction from the pullback, uh, which itself was an overcorrection to the bubble, the, the hype of 2021. So yeah, it's not a sign of excitement coming back. It's, it's just the market stabilizing. The whole this cycle feels different with magic is probably a bigger story than it is with the Bitcoin thing. Look, I'm sure over the next so many years, it's going to keep going up. It could crash by the time you watch this video. It could break all-time highs. Nobody has a clue the short-term direction of these things. It's all speculation. It is what it is. 
But when you look at the cards, the world of magic, you know, I, I almost feel like maybe that's something that we all haven't fully calculated yet, is that the real impact of the last two-year bear market in Magic 30, maybe it wasn't the prices tanking. Maybe it was more the vacuum of people leaving the market and the chatter of how everybody's told everybody about what happened of Magic 30. And the damage is just, maybe it really is a fundamental... Maybe that really did change the fork in the road. Maybe that did set us on a new path in the future that did change everything. And it that could very well be a real thing. This is something I've wondered as well. I think about it like a receding tide. So before we had a mix of players and collectors from all eras and they were participating in the market together, right? So supply and demand, um, it was creating certain price points for these cards, which was an amalgamation of all these different people with different goals and, you know, being at different points in their collecting or playing careers. Uh, my, myself and viewers of my channel have long been trying to understand how these markets break between the older generations and the younger generations. You know, if I could peel open the order book, say, for Jazam Jin, you know, who is after that card? Is it all old timers? Or has it been changing over time? You know, th these kind of insights would be uh, really useful, but generally speaking, they're not accessible. Um, except I think Magic 30 might have done a bit of that for us because it disproportionately impacted the older collectors, in my opinion. We, you know, from the 90s and 2000s, we are the ones the reserved list promise was made to. We are the ones with the deepest nostalgia and therefore the largest uh, sort of emotional impact site from a move like Magic 30. So I think Magic 30 probably scattered many older players more than it scattered uh, newer players in the hobby, which effectively is pulling back the tide. And now we get to see who's left. And one way to interpret the current market is to consider that, that some of these prices that we're seeing, um, the amount of demand, that this is what's left when you chop off some non-trivial percent of the old timers, when the sort of younger, newer entrants into the hobby are now more represented. Um, I'm skeptical. I still love the old cards. doesn't change my attitude on buying them from collections or hoarding them and being rooty like I've been the last 20 years, but there is a very real chance now that for many, many years from now, even if we continue to see slow upticks, there's not going to be any major excitement around the old cards. And there is a small probable chance that, you know, one of the outcomes of the future is that the, the pool of people wanting old magic does diminish year over year. Therefore, putting less demand of people wanting those cards. There's always going to be some X supply and X demand of people who want them versus how many are out there, which is why they're always going to have some form of value. But I don't... It, the market does not feel excited. Once again, I found this entire sequence a bit alarming, uh, coming from Rudy. So I, I do agree with the way he, he hedges a bit. You always have to look at outcomes as possible paths on a road with many different ways to go. So there's still many ways Hasbro could invigorate the hobby and sort of swoop in and save the day. But uh, they've, not, they've not even come close um, to doing that so far, and there's no evidence of that yet. People searching for old Magic cards online, people, the bids and the, the quantity of people trying to accumulate remains very weak. And that can be into the argument of the, the lost trust of Magic 30, the directions, they're going to run out of things to reprint, they eventually just got to break the reserve list and nuke the system. You know, all these things that's been on the internet for the dawn of time. But that's where we're at. So, I'm not sure how many years, if ever, we are going to see a, I don't want to call it a bubble, but like a, another euphoric run. Another exciting era of vintage magic cards. I agree here. These are possibilities people should appreciate if they have large positions. Uh, that's, those are the main parts that I wanted to review. Um, my purpose is not to become some negative Nancy channel. 
Uh, but I do want to sound the alarm for two reasons. First, there is the tiny chance that someone with the power to guide Hasbro into better decisions uh, hears this stuff. And so, you know, I want to make sure that, that it's out there. Um, but second, I do think there's a lot of people who really love this stuff. Um, you know, they, they care deeply about it. It has history with them. But perhaps they haven't taken the time to fully appreciate the amount of risk that they're carrying. You know, channels like Rudy's can lead to overconfidence. And, you know, this isn't something he's trying to do, I don't think. I think it's just a consequence of the fact that he's um, enthusiastic, he really loves this stuff, and he's very optimistic about the future. And that's all fine. But I think it leads people to believe that, you know, while a Legends card might not outperform the S&P, it's never going to go to zero. Uh, strictly speaking, I, I actually do think that's true, but um, the truth is we don't know that. And there's plenty of numbers that are above zero that, that would still be catastrophic to the market. So I know as well as anyone that, you know, when emotions and nostalgia get too tangled with investments, smart and careful people can nonetheless get themselves into trouble. So look, buy this stuff all you want. You know, I certainly am. Just take a look at all this stuff. Awesome cards here. Uh, but do it fully understanding what you're doing. That's all. That was the main point of my video. I just wanted to call attention to this, this change in tone that we're hearing from Rudy. Really because it's so unlikely to be coming from him. Like I said in the beginning, he is a permable. He loves this stuff. He's been through downturns. And he's never really questioned what's going to come out on the other side. Uh, I certainly don't think that he's throwing in the towel, you know, nor am I, as I said in my video on this topic. Um, in my analysis, it's, it's merely a change of percentages. Less, <clears throat> less favorable outcomes now strike me as a little bit more likely, not overwhelmingly so, but a little bit more likely. Uh, and I do wonder if he's thinking along those lines as well. Well, anyway, food for thought. I'd be curious what you all thought of his video. I think almost all of my viewers watch his stuff, so I'm sure you all saw the, the video in its entirety. Uh, let me know what you think. All right, that's all for today. Thanks for joining me. If you're enjoying my content and you want me to make more videos more frequently, then go buy me a lottery ticket. And if I win, I'll be able to retire early and do more of this in my free time. See you next time.